Thank you for joining the Weave Online User Group. And thank you also for joining the last uh, talk of our spring season here, where we have a series of guest speakers. So I see many uh, repeated names. So it's great to see our users coming back for our second and fourth Tuesdays of every month. Uh, today, we have Ray Sang from Google. So we're very excited to have him speak. So Ray will be speaking in the first half of today's meeting on um, Docker use cases in which um, you might have low bandwidth. So there might be one case where you're at home, but he also has some actually really useful use cases for um, certain type of um, work situations as well. So it's not just about being in a New York apartment with low bandwidth. So I'm really excited to hear about that. So with that, I'll let Ray take over and share his slides. All Thanks. right, very cool. Well, thanks for having me. Um, it's my first time uh, doing uh, this with the uh, Weave uh, online user group, so I'm uh, very excited to be here. And uh, let me get started. My name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, what that means is I love to bring some of our uh, latest and greatest technology to developers all over the world. But uh, I've been uh, also an engineer for a very long time, about uh, 15 years in the industry. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, Google Cloud or uh, any of the things that we talk about in this session, uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Satanism. Okay. So um, I want to start this talk with uh, one of the issues that I had uh, when I was in DevOps Belgium. That was in 2015. And um, it was one of the you know, biggest Java conference in the world, uh, very prominent conference as well. It was like my debut uh, into uh, the community in a way. Uh, and for that conference, I was presenting you know, using containers and orchestrating microservices with Kubernetes. And I love to do the live demos. I only have live demos. I, what that means is I'm, I do live coding. I have to present everything with live internet because I have to run things on the cloud. And um, I, I don't think I can show the video here. I have a link to this video uh, at the end of the, 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 the slides. But um, what happened was, about 10 minutes into it, I was, you know, I finished my live coding. I was about to create a container. And all of a sudden, I discovered that my internet has gone away. Even though I tested it before the session, but during the session, you know, there were about 400 people in the room. And I don't know what happened. The internet just went away. And that was pretty bad, uh, considering that was my very first you know, large conference uh, presenting on this topic. And I have no backups. I absolutely have no backups. Fortunately, my awesome coworker from Google Cloud Platform from the, uh, the developer advocacy team as well, uh, his name is Frances Campoy. He said, don't worry, Ray. I'm going to you know, start my mobile phone with a tethering so you can tether to my phone on my international plane. And uh, you can you know, do your demo that way. And I thought, Francesc, are you sure? Because you know, I'm running Docker containers. And um, you know, containers, as you know, if you see anybody who's trying to do a live demo on a conference Wi-Fi, you see how they fail in a lot of times because the internet is so slow. And I'm about to do, to do this over the uh, a tethered connection on an international plane. So are you sure we can do this? Uh, and I was able to do it. I was able to go through the entire presentation uh, just fine. I was able to build my containers from, from my laptop. I was able to uh, deploy them onto Kubernetes. Uh, and at the end of the talk, people were just wondering, well, how did I actually do it? How did I actually do all of these things um, via somebody's tethered cell phone? And this actually goes back to um, you know, about three years ago when I moved to New York. Uh, I realized that I've been preparing for that moment ever since I moved to New York. When I moved to New York from California, I was trying to find the, you know, some of the cheapest place I can live. And um, one of the places I found was you know, a, a, a very small studio. So on, I found this place on Craigslist. I saw, I saw the photo. Um, and it was actually really, really nice, uh, except it's, what, it's about 180 square feet. So what that means is it only fits a, uh, a queen, uh, like a full-size bed in the room, and there was a full bathroom. That was pretty awesome for me at the time because it was pretty cheap. Uh, electricity and utilities all included. The only problem is that you see that there's like this nice guy uh, outside the window. Well, that doesn't really exist. Um, and neither did the bed and everything else. So, but I was really excited. 
Uh, here's the floor plan of house uh, of this uh, studio. Again, it's 180 square feet. It's about 18 square meters, as I was told. Uh, here you can actually see that um, you know I can fit a bed just right nicely into this little groove. Uh, so I actually fit a sofa bed here. And uh, the first thing I got myself was a 15-inch TV, which I put neatly against the wall. And the TV actually spans across the entire wall. That's how small the place was. And, uh, and I also had a, a mini fridge that came with the apartment. And I thought, OK, I'll, I'll probably keep that. Right? So the mini fridge is at the bottom left here. Uh, so it's, it was a very, very small place. Not only did it come with utilities prepaid, uh, it also came with, uh, with uh, what do you call it, uh, free internet as well. Okay? So here's the door. Uh, and that's the bathroom, which I didn't draw out. Uh, that's the closet, which actually fit everything I brought from California. And that's my TV. And that's my sofa bed. Okay? Now, with the free Wi-Fi, uh, it was free, but it was really slow. Uh, what I didn't realize was that the Wi-Fi access point was in my landlord's uh, apartment, which is above me, you know, a floor above me. And the Wi-Fi signal travels horizontally, but not uh, up and down. So I was actually having a lot of difficulties for the whole year to connect to Wi-Fi. Uh, to give you a perspective where the access point was, uh, where I usually stay in the living room uh, with my sofa bed, it has really bad Wi-Fi. But the access point is actually right around the corner by the bathroom. So I had really good Wi-Fi there. So what that means is if I really need Wi-Fi, I have to move uh, to just next to the bathroom and, uh, and use my internet from there. And that didn't work out so well. So what happened then next is uh, I had to go out to Starbucks or go out to some other places to use the internet. And again, that's also very slow in most cases. Uh, just to give you a perspective of how small this place is, uh, these are standard size containers, right? These are standard size uh, 50 uh, feet, 48 feet, uh, down to eight, uh, 20 feet containers. And my apartment just is about that. That's about the size of my apartment. So not only was I building containers, I literally live in an apartment that's uh, smaller than a container in this case. All right? So I travel over the world as well. I, I travel on the train, I travel on the airplane. And I do have to use containers all the time for my talks, for my demos, for my work. And um, I really just had to devise a way to deal with this. Uh, I mean, it's you know, 2017, and I still couldn't get reliable internet. And the most problematic things I had to deal with is really just you know, potentially downloading large Docker images. And you never know when they are going to come up. When you depend on a base image, you just don't know what other images is going to be uh, downloaded, right? What other layers are actually there? And um, I try to use some of the latest images. So every time I try to do a build, there's a possibility that I want to report all the images. And I certainly don't want to do that over very slow internet. I'm also on a Mac. And uh, what I really don't like is to run the uh, uh, Docker in a, a virtual machine. Uh, the, it was very problematic back then. It's gotten a lot better now. But still, like, I, I don't really want it to be a VM on my Mac uh, because uh, sometimes I do you know, get into these time skew problems. And when that happens, I had to restart the VMs all the time. And that got really annoying. And I was actually thinking about, well, why can't I not just run Docker on a server somewhere? And I can just connect to that server from my local client, and everything will just work fine. And I, as I was starting to research into this, um, I almost built a server myself, built out the script myself. Then I discovered the Docker machine you know, about two years ago. And Docker machine was really nice because you can actually create a Docker machine uh, directly uh, in a VM of own, your own choice, or potentially uh, creating Docker machine directly on a cloud platform, like in this case on Google Cloud. And what's really easy to do, you say, you say Docker machine create Docker. And then you give it the driver, and they have driver for many different providers. Uh, in this case, we can create one on Google Cloud. You just have to give it the project name and the size of the machine, and it just goes off and uh, creates everything for you behind the scenes. So that was pretty easy to do. Okay? And that's what I've been doing ever since. And that is my trick. Um, when I had really slow internet, I do everything uh, from this Docker machine. But I run my Docker client locally. Uh, because um, I like to edit my files locally. I don't want to go into a VM 
and editing my files via a text editor. Uh, sometimes I just like to use my own IDE to edit it, all the files locally. And then I can still do the regular commands. I can use Docker build, I can use Docker run, just as if I was running locally on my machine, except all of these things are being done on a remote machine instead, OK? Um, so this really, really helps uh, for me. So I'll just show you a few things that I learned as I was um, working in this style, um, dealing with just slow bandwidth. So first of all, um, from one of my demos, I use Groovy uh, as the language, and I can you know, compile a Groovy uh, application really, really easily. Uh, in this case, I'm running Spring and Spring Boot uh, for Java applications. And I can literally just you know, compile my application, say Spring, uh, Run, and Dot. And this will just find my Groovy files and start my application that way. Now, to build the Docker container, uh, of course, I can use a Docker file. Um, but if I build this application locally, what that's going to do is to create this jar file that has a lot of dependencies. And this artifact, this jar, will be you know, 30, 40 megabytes large. And if I want to send this uh, to build the Docker image, uh, it's actually going to send 40 megabytes across the wire uh, to the Docker server to build that image. And that doesn't really solve my problem of running this on a slow bandwidth, because I end up you know, sending another 40 megabytes. So what I found at the time, about you know, two years ago, that the thing that you could use is the using a Docker unbuild. So with the unbuild semantics, what you can do is you can send in the source code. And then uh, during the Docker build stage, it's actually going to execute extra uh, commands to actually build your artifact. So you can send in just the, the source. And then out comes the build jar file and put into the right directories in the Docker container. And then you have the Docker container image. right? So for example, I can do something like this. And I can say, uh, let me build the test image and just do that. As you can see, all I need to send in is about seven kilobytes. And behind the scenes here is going to do all the dependency downloads and downloads the, the, the other um, dependencies in Maven, whatever. Uh, and all of these things are going to be done via the server remotely. Right? So that was pretty cool. Uh, and then I later found out you can also compress the, uh, the files that you sent to the Docker daemon. So here I'm sending about seven kilobytes. And if I were to uh, really be on, you know, on a stretch here, um, really, really still internet somewhere, I can do the compress. And that will compress the data that I sent to the Docker daemon. And I can get this down to about one kilobyte, which is really nice. Okay? Now, <clears throat> recently, though, uh, there was something really nice that Docker uh, is able to support. Is quite experimental, but I haven't had really a lot of issue with it. And that's multi-stage build. And for that, I got another example here, where I can actually you know, build my application in one of the stages. So here I'm using Java and Maven. So I can start with the Maven base container. I can copy my source code into it. And then I can build my artifact. And then I can copy my artifact into uh, the actual target container. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm using OpenJDK 8 target container. And then everything will just work. Now, I also want to be careful not to send in the, the artifacts that's built locally, because otherwise, that will be another 15 megabytes or so. So in Docker Ignore, I just ignore the target directory. And I can, again, uh, build this thing pretty well. Let me see here. Oh, there we go. So I can do Docker build compress. And I can build my container this way also. And all it's going to send is the source code. And it's going to go and build uh, in the first stage and then copy it to the, the destination container. And I can make that container pretty small as well. Okay? And finally, there is another way to do it, which is uh, if you don't want to run Docker locally at all or even in a VM, uh, for example, on Google Cloud, we have what we call a container builder. It's a service that you can use. Uh, basically, what that means is you can just use our command line utility called gcloud. I can say gcloud container build. Let me submit a new build. I can give it the tag. So what that means is that when I give it the tag, when this container is built, it will actually automatically be pushed into Google Cloud's uh, container registry. Right? So this will be a private registry that only you are able to access. So if I do it this way, then it's going to, again, send my local context compressed uh, into uh, Google Cloud, in this case, and have the container builder uh, go through my Docker file Again, in all of these cases, the download of the, the dependencies, the download of the images and image layers, 
all of those things are being done in the cloud, so I don't have to use my local bandwidth. And it works really well uh, when I'm traveling around and uh, trying to test out new things. Okay? Now, there are a few other tips and tricks that I learned. Uh, well, first of all, when the Docker daemon is running somewhere else, right, obviously, uh, the Docker volume mount doesn't really work anymore um, because you cannot mount your local laptop's drive into a remote server's Docker daemon. When you do a Docker V, or when you try to mount a volume, it's actually going to try to mount a volume from the, the remote VM instead. So I had to deal with, for example, uh, being able to copy files around. So if I ever need to build something remotely that I have dependencies on, that I need to use a volume, then I need to use, uh, I can use a Docker Machine's uh, CP. I can copy files into it. But you know, that gets a little tiring after a while. What a lot of people don't know that I realized is that, and I found this out during my, my expedition into this whole thing, is that uh, with Docker, you can actually pipe. Uh, just like a command line, you can pipe input in into your process that's running remotely in a Docker daemon, or you can pipe things out of it as well. So, so for example, um, I, I built this uh, a deep dream container, right? So uh, if I can find my deep dream container somewhere, deep dream coi Docker right here. So I actually built a deep dream container that uh, people can use. And um, you know, so what it does is that you use um, the, the, the open source uh, Google Deep Dream uh, sample code, where it takes an image and it feeds through the neural network to kind of see what the, uh, the neural network was seeing. And I, I really didn't want to install Python and everything else locally, so I made a container out of it. But because I'm running my container, container remotely, uh, what that also means is every time I need to uh, use Deep Dream to generate a new image, I actually have to copy it into my container uh, server and then get it out. And that got annoying. So with the piping semantics, just like a regular uh, Unix command line, uh, what I can do is I can just you know, cat my image. I can pipe it into my container. And I can output it um, from STD out. Okay? So for example, here, I have an image of a cat. So if I open this up, I got an image of a cat. And there you go. Yeah. So if I want to run this through Deep Dream, uh, that's containerized, I can actually do a, I can, let me see here, I can cat the cat. I can cat the cat. I can uh, pipe it to my container that's able to receive the data from STD in. And then it's going to output my JPEG file in STD out. So I can just do this. Um, so I'm going to cat my uh, JPEG, uh, JPEG into my container. Right, it's now executing it. And all comes the output. And I can just open up this output. And there it is. That's, the, uh, that's using std in and out uh, directly from container. And that actually proved to be pretty useful because later on, I was writing a utility uh, for OAuth authentication and stuff. And I was, it was written in Go. And I didn't want to deal with the Go and Go, go fetch and all, all of those uh, dependency downloads directly on my local computer. So what I did is I actually wrote a script to do the build. And the build is actually happening in the container. So I have a build container that's able to um, take in my source file. And then I can uh, create, basically, I can build for multiple ar architectures and for multiple platforms. And for that, I actually just use uh, Docker Run. Right, I, uh, I give it the, the source code. Uh, but here's the trick. I can output all of the uh, binaries out. But in this case, I'm building for multiple architectures. So not only do I have a single binary, I actually have multiple files I have to send. And the beauty here is that I can actually tar all the files together. I can send this to std out. And on the way out, I can uh, decompress it. I can untar it. And out comes everything that's being built from inside the container. And with this technique, I don't really have to do SCPs anymore. Right? So for example, I can do script uh, build like that. So again, it's going to send in my Go file into my build container. And uh, out comes the, uh, the different architecture uh, binaries. And that's being tarred inside the container and then tarred, untarred from outside of the container. And now I should have multiple binaries that I get. Now, this is actually proven a little useful for some of the, the other people. Right? 
I actually use this technique a lot for just my own purpose. You know, for example, just dealing with my travelings and my slow internet. But um, I actually have seen people who use the same techniques when they are in an organization where they don't want people to um, to install or run their own Docker daemon. They can actually have a centralized Docker daemon some, running somewhere in the organization or in the cloud, and everybody can potentially get the credentials to access that Docker daemon. And when they do the build, they will be building on a remote machine rather than on their own. And that's, uh, that's actually quite useful in some settings. Okay, So uh, with that, if you have um, any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And uh, if you like to see the talk that I failed miserably with the internet, you can see it on the Ray T DevOps 2015. And uh, if you want to read more, I actually documented all of these things in a blog. Uh, it's called My Docker Container versus uh, My Docker versus Slow Internet. And you can find this on my Medium. And here's the Bitly link to that as well. So with all that said, thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. How did you get this awesome is one of the questions. <laughs> the question is, how did you get this awesome? So that's. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> I, had, I had no choice. I had no choice but to uh, figure out a way to work with uh, uh, Docker demons, um, because otherwise um, I, I couldn't do any work. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to guess from your background that you might actually be in a Google office today because someone was asking if you are in your bathroom right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, actually, no, I'm, uh, I am in a Google office today. Yeah, yeah. No, I actually since moved to a much bigger place, uh, so I'm not in that container-sized uh, apartments anymore. <laughs> so actually, I, I did want to ask, um, because you gave this specific use case and then you shared a little bit of examples. Um, but could you relist again um, use cases outside of just working in your apartment that you've seen and then maybe even think of other um, work related scenarios that people would definitely benefit from? Because even, let's say, even if you do have great bandwidth, yeah. it's just, I think it's just best practices, right? So maybe we could reiterate um, some examples. Yeah, so like for example, I, I have seen in organizations where I mean people talk, talk tell me this as well. And when I lead when I'm leading a lab, for example, if I ever seen a Docker lab or a Kubernetes lab, uh, one of the biggest issue people have is actually installing the thing, like getting it up and running. And um, it's probably the most troublesome. It's gotten a lot better, I have to say, uh, but um, but still, uh, some people have locked down uh, laptops. Um, and they just have a lot of trouble just running VMs in the first place. Uh, if, whether you're on Mac or uh, Windows, you run into the same issue. And um, I've seen people where they uh, they just you know, get tired of that as well. And so they also run a VM locally in their organization. And so the benefit here is that not everybody has to install Docker daemon locally. Uh, when they build, they can build on a single box, for example, potentially. And um, and you are pretty sure that they are using the same image layers. Uh, one of the some of the issues that if you don't if you are not diligent enough, right? When you build a container with the latest tag, um, you're not ever supposed to do that. But if you did, your latest version of the layers could be different from another person's latest version of the layers, right? Uh, and if you are able to build on the same box. Again, you should avoid that by all cost, but the, if it does happen, then on the same box, it doesn't always happen that way. But again, there are other best practices to go around now. Um, but the, a lot of people don't really know about the piping. And, and uh, for me, if I were to um, uh, to write a new project in Go or something else that requires a build process, uh, rather than installing all of those things locally, I can just make a build container out of it. And um, I don't ever have to worry about reinstalling those toolings locally on my computer anymore. And I can use the, the build container to do it for me. And to get the binary out, I actually use the same techniques with the standard in and standard out. Uh, the other thing I have done is actually uh, running um, a Go IDE uh, in a container. And uh, I have another, another blog on that. So with the IDEs, the, the, uh, it's a, it's a text-based IDE, but uh, with IDEs is that uh, you have to install all of these plugins. I'm using VI, you have to install all these VI plugins. So rather than running installing these plugins locally on my laptop, I just run them in a container. And um, I, again, I use the same technique to run this uh, text editor remotely, even though um, it's, you know, I, I'm editing the files. 
uh, on my laptop, but it, it's actually running remotely. And this actually was really helpful because um, my laptop was outdated one day and uh, they had to replace it with a new one. And rather than reinstalling all the toolings, whether it's the build toolings or the, the IDE toolings, uh, I just replaced the laptop and you know get my Docker uh, credentials again and I was able to get back to my work. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah, actually, while you were presenting, I was wondering, is this a moment to have a uh, Google IDE plug? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so there's uh, there's a there's a kind of like um, I mean, there's not an online IDE, but uh, there are some online IDEs that's really good out there as well. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but we do have something called the Cloud Shell. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I the reason I like to run this server remotely is because I, I still want to edit my files locally. And um, but if you don't mind editing files remotely, you can actually just run this in a VM. And uh, Google Cloud, we have something called Google Cloud Shell. What that is is a free instance, a free VM instance you can access directly from the, the browser. And when you go in there, it has all the toolings pre-installed, and you can build Docker containers, you can build your Java applications uh, directly on that instance. And uh, that's really useful for lab for for me to lead a lab, mm -hmm. uh, so people don't have to install local toolings because otherwise that would take like hour or two hours just to get started. And that's, uh, uh, that's too long, yeah. Okay, so I'll stop chit-chatting because we do have a question. Okay. Um, so someone said, if you have the source code locally and it needs to be pushed into a remote container, you still have to push the code over a slow connection. Yep. How does the on-build directive help with this? Right, so the on-build so, uh, on directive helps in case, uh, in terms of when you have the source code in the container uh, build environment ready then the unbuild will be responsible to download all the subsequent dependencies. So because I'm a Java developer, I build with Maven, and uh, sometimes I have a lot of Maven dependencies, and that itself could be you know, 20 to 100 megabytes I have to pull down to my machine. So, so it's a trade-off, right? I can push my source, which is a couple kilobytes, and if you uh, use the compress argument, then you can compress it down to like 1K or 2K. And the trade-off there is even though I'm sending 2K, the rest of the download of the uh, the images is actually uh, on the remote server, so it's much, much faster. Not only that, when I do a Docker push, and I, I didn't show it, did I? When I do a Docker push to a, a registry, rather than pushing hundred, hundreds of megabytes or multiple layers from my local laptop, um, again, I can push it directly from cloud to cloud. And uh, that really, that really, you know, that 200, you know, 2K source code I send versus hundreds of megabytes I need to send otherwise, I think it's a great trade-off for me, yeah. All right, okay. are there any other questions? Because we're at about time, actually. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you for closing out our season with this wonderful talk, and it was really great to finally meet you face-to-face. -face, <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, definitely check out the blog. Is, uh, we have, um, I have a lot more uh, other uh, practices on there as well, so. Okay. Thank yes. you for having me. Yes, Cheers. and um, for the listeners, we'll make sure we get those links and we'll share them in the follow-up email. So I'll get those from you. Thank you, Ray. All right, and with that, we have Luke. Hello. Hello. Uh, awesome, Ray, thank you. That was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so thanks for coming and, and presenting. Um, yeah, so uh, in the next sort of 25 minutes or so, um, I'm gonna cover um, a different topic. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we're still talking about containers, uh, but I'm going to talk about continuous delivery and Kubernetes. Um, so I'll just share my screen and um, then I will go through some slides. So this talk normally takes an hour. So uh, I'm probably not going to have time to do the demos. Um, so we'll see if that cuts it down to, to 25 minutes. Um, and I guess I'll go a little bit quickly. Um, so um, this talk is called Continuous Delivery the Hard Way with Kubernetes. Uh, the reason it's called the hard way is that um, I'm going to build up an architecture for doing continuous delivery from simple to complicated. And at each point, um, as I go from simple to complicated, I'm going to explain why um, the next step in the architecture is worth doing. Um, even though it adds some complexity. And actually, we'll see in the last architecture um, that we refactor things in such a way that, that some of that complexity goes away. So um, so it's, it's called the hard way because it's kind of doing it from scratch and then going through the experience of 
of setting it up from the beginning. Um, so um, I will just say that there are some opinions in this talk um, and uh, that uh, you should please take everything I say with a pinch of salt. This is uh, an approach to continuous delivery that works really well for us at WeaveWorks. Um, but uh, you may have different opinions and that's absolutely fine. So uh, if you do, please voice them um, either in the uh, chat um, as we go or in the Q&A at the end or on our Slack channel. Um, so just very quickly, uh, why people do continuous delivery at all? Uh, what do I mean by continuous delivery? Um, so when I, when I say continuous delivery, what I mean is this idea that we can uh, ship changes to software faster. Um, and if we can change, if we can ship changes to software faster, uh, then it means we can get features out and we can get bug fixes out to the world um, faster, and that makes us more competitive as a software team. Uh, the job of a software team is really to ship features and fix problems as quickly as possible. Um, <clears throat> and this is a lot easier if you take an approach to software development that's based around microservices. Um, microservices, of course, as probably most people know, are this idea that you can take um, a monolithic application and break it up uh, that, that gets sort of delivered as a single piece uh, and deliver it uh, and break it up into lots of separate components that interact with each other using well-defined APIs. Um, and there's this other idea called Conway's law, which says that the structure of your organization, uh, the, sorry, the structure of your software ends up mirroring the software of your, org the, the structure of your organization. So if you have one big software team, you'll probably build one big product. Um, but if you have lots of independent software teams that are working on uh, let's say, just restricted scope uh, for each of those projects, um, then you end up with a system that looks more microservices-y. Uh, and that can help you scale your project because it means that there's uh, fewer people on a team, means that there's less communication overhead, um, and it means that you can, you can scale uh, the entire organization, and that gives you velocity. So that's why uh, we do microservices. Um, in terms of continuous delivery, once you've got this sort of microservices approach with lots of small teams, the idea is that each team can just ship a change whenever they like. Um, and uh, in fact, the, um, shipping changes should happen more and more frequently um, because the more frequently you ship changes, the less scary uh, each change is. Um, if you ship changes multiple times a day, then um, it just becomes completely normal that you're always shipping changes. And that's what I mean by continuous delivery. Um, so I'll go quickly over this. Uh, this is about continuous delivery with Kubernetes. Um, this is uh, a slide that I call everything you need to know about Kubernetes on one slide. Um, basically, inside Kubernetes, you have Docker containers that sit inside pods. Uh, and pods just contain more than one Docker container on a single machine. And then deployments can span multiple machines. And deployments can say, I want you to stamp out this many pods. Uh, then you can also have services, which are ways of, of, of naming things and routing traffic into, uh, into a, a set of pods that are chosen by a selector. Uh, and Kubernetes has this idea of labels and selectors. Um, labels just say like key value pairs on things and selectors say they're basically like a search query. So show me the things that match this, that match this query. Um, I'll also just talk a little bit about GitLab. Um, I use GitLab as an example um, in, in this talk, um, uh, or at least I would if I had time to do any demos. Um, and, uh, and GitLab uh, contains a few different things. It has a bunch of uh, version control. You can version control your code in GitLab. Uh, you also have a built-in CI system in GitLab, and you also have a built-in Docker or container image registry. Um, you can do everything that I'll show you today using uh, GitHub, Travis, CircleCI, uh, Docker Hub, Quay.io, GCR, GCB, etc. There's lots of other tools out there. Um, there's just convenient to use GitLab because it bundles all of these things in a single place. Um, so, so let's actually dive into the architecture then. Um, these are the different components that we've got. I mentioned that we have a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I mentioned that we have um, uh, these other pieces that are bundled with GitLab. So you have version controlled code. Um, this is your code as a circle here. Uh, then you have a CI system. And the CI system's job is to take version controlled code as it changes and build Docker images. Then you have a Docker registry, which is where you store those Docker images. And then you have a Kubernetes cluster. And Kubernetes clusters take Kubernetes YAML, which I'm describing with this triangle in the diagram. Um, so um, the different APIs that these different pieces uh, sort of speak um, 
is, uh, is as follows. Um, version controlled code is typically using Git. Uh, a CI system is basically a glorified uh, shell script runner um, that is triggered by Git being, uh, being um, modified, so source code changing. Um, then you have a Docker registry, uh, which speaks the Docker registry API, which is a well-defined API that, that Docker came up with. And then you have Kubernetes, which, of course, speaks the Kubernetes API. And um, so if anyone's ever seen uh, the film Apollo 13, there's this wonderful bit in Apollo 13 where the astronauts are um, on their way to the moon and there's this uh, uh, a disaster occurs. Um, and uh, I won't ruin it for anyone who, who hasn't watched the film, but it's a very good film. But anyway, there's, there's this point in the film where um, they realize that in order to save the astronauts' lives, they're going to have to jerry-rig um, a, a carbon dioxide filter um, from one part of the spacecraft that wasn't designed to fit into um, the socket in another part of the spacecraft. And they literally have to put a square peg into a round hole. And of course, the way they fix this uh, is with duct tape, because duct tape is how you solve 99% of problems in space. Um, and it feels a little bit like this is what we're doing here. We're looking, we've got all of these different components. Um, they, they have different APIs. They have different things that are different shapes. Um, and we need to figure out how to, how to duct tape them together. Um, so let's start with the simplest possible thing we can imagine, because that's a good way to, um, to develop software um, and, and to do DevOps, um, because uh, it's nice to start with, with sort of an MVP. Um, so let's say that our very initial architecture is that we basically we just use GitLab as we're meant to use it. So we take uh, version controlled code, uh, we pump it into a CI system which builds container images, um, and um, then uh, you push that into a, a Docker registry. And notice that um, the Docker registry, the, sorry, the Kubernetes cluster is now not actually um, uh, doing anything. It hasn't been hooked up yet. So how are we going to hook it up? Um, well, we start by hooking it up, hooking it up by just ran, manually running kubectl apply minus f with the name of a service. Um, I mentioned services uh, earlier. I actually, when I say service here, I guess I mean deployment. Um, and a, the, the deployment file, um, the YAML file, will refer to a specific Docker image and a specific Docker tag. It'll pull that down onto the Kubernetes cluster and run it. Um, so. There is actually a way of automating deploying an update. So remember, the goal here is to do continuous delivery. So what we want is every single time a, a, a new change hits the master branch of this version control system, it should be deployed to this Kubernetes cluster. Let's say, for example, that it's a staging cluster. And the staging cluster is like um, uh, the cluster that you always want to be running the latest version of all of your services that are like master ahead. Um, so the first thing uh, that we'll do is we can hook this up by um, uh, by adding this additional arrow here and having the CI system now take responsibility for uh, pushing that change to the cluster. And there is a command that we can use to do this. So let's look at the commands that get run as we push a code change through the system. So we're going from version control code, which is modified by a git push, um, into a CI system, which is building a new container image with a certain tag. Um, and then it's being pushed into a Docker registry, um, probably with the same tag. Uh, and then um, the Kubernetes cluster is being um, told to uh, use a specific version of an image um, by uh, this command called kubectl set image. Um, and what kubectl set image does is it just says whatever the running version of this deployment is running in the cluster right now update it to be using this new image, and then you can specify a new image tag. Um, and so like many things that have been duct taped together, this sort of works. Um, but there are some problems with it. And one of the first problems that comes uh, when you try and do a rollback. So when you do a rollback, uh, you maybe uh, you realize that a version of a certain service is, has gone bad. Um, you check out master, you maybe revert the commit at head, and then you push um, master back to the version control system. Now uh, the CI system has to do a whole new build. Uh, it has to create a whole new container image. Um, and especially if you're on a slow internet connection, <laughs> or if your CI system is on a slow internet connection, uh, then this might take a long time. 
Uh, and pushing it uh, might also take a long time, um, unless you're using some of the tricks that we saw earlier uh, earlier today. Um, then uh, the Kubernetes cluster um, has this kubectl set image. And so you end up with this different image tag uh, that actually corresponds to an old version of the code. And so you end up duplicating uh, disk space here because you've got this old, the, the, the old, the actual old tag, and you've got the new old tag, if that makes sense, because it's the new old tag that refers to uh, the old version of the code. Um, so like I said, the downsides to this are that building and pushing containers is slow. It takes up disk IO, uh, it uses network, um, and it would be great if we didn't have to do this when we were rolling back. Uh, and the reason for that is that when you do a rollback, it's normally because something's broken. And when something's broken, everyone's running around like headless chickens, and they want to get it fixed as quickly as possible. Um, uh, there's a few other downsides to this, but because I'm running a bit short on time, I'm going to sort of skip over that. Um, and I'm going to say that another uh, problem with this approach is that um, all of the um, configuration about what's running in your cluster um, is now uh, is now just stored sort of in memory in the Kubernetes cluster. Actually, technically, it's stored in etcd. Uh, but what that means is that um, if you accidentally delete your entire production cluster, like um, someone I know did once a few months ago, um, then uh, then you end up with this problem of you don't actually know what was running. Um, uh, and so in order to solve this problem, it can be beneficial to take all the YAML files that describe all of the different parts of your Kubernetes cluster and put them in one place. So putting all the uh, Kubernetes configuration in a single repo, and I, uh, I, I thought that YAML sounded a bit like camel, so I found a, a, a rare picture of camels um, all in the same place. They're normally roaming freely uh, in the desert. Um, so anyway, uh, we've, let's build a V2 architecture that tries to solve this problem of uh, not being able to um, restore from your restore uh, the state of your cluster to a known good state um, if uh, if you accidentally destroy your cluster. Um, so this v2 architecture introduces this new concept of this version controlled config. And the version controlled config, like I said, it stores um, a copy of all of the, uh, it's, it, it acts like a source of truth for what's actually running in your cluster. So you might have a code change that gets pushed through uh, into version control. It gets built by the CI system into a Docker image. Uh, the Docker image um, gets pushed to the Docker registry. Um, and then the CI system is responsible for checking out the latest version of the version controlled config, uh, modifying it in place, and then pushing it back. And then finally, pushing that update to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and uh, then the Kubernetes cluster will download the latest uh, Docker image from the registry. Um, so this is OK. Um, it has helped us solve that problem of not knowing what was running. Um, because you now have uh, this sort of version control config, which is a source of truth. But what I don't like about this, uh, this solution is that it, um, you end up with the CI system doing a lot. Um, CI systems are really good at, at testing things and pushing container images. Um, but when you start sort of overloading this uh, in a script, perhaps, in your CI system, then this, this work of checking out the version control config, modifying it and pushing it back, becomes something that's a little bit error prone. Uh, in fact, it's quite error prone, and it's difficult to get right. Um, so um, anyway, we've now got to a point where we can recreate our entire production environment um, from the YAML repo, uh, even if our entire production cluster got deleted. Um, so like I said, I don't like the fact that the CI system is now responsible for a lot of different stuff. Um, and we can still only trigger the CI system by pushing code. So we haven't actually solved that first problem we described of uh, needing to, uh, of, of wanting to be able to do rollbacks more quickly. Um, then um, there are also some more subtle problems with this architecture, which is that if your CI system is responsible for doing your deployments and is responsible for re recording the, the source of truth, um, then if you happen to have parallel deployments, uh, then, then they can tread on each other's toes. And actually, this is quite likely in a large organization that has lots of DevOps teams. You'd end up with this sort of race condition between the Git checkout and the Git push um, in, in this part of the system here, uh, where the CI system is responsible for grabbing this and 
uh, checking it out, modifying it, and pushing it back. And there's no way of doing that atomically with Git. So you end up with the situation where the CI system um, uh, could, if there are two instances of it running in parallel, um, it could break itself and then end up with merge conflicts. And because it's a computer that's doing uh, this merging, um, or rather a computer that's, that's making these changes to these YAMLs and then, and then instantiating Git, um, the computer isn't going to be able to manually recover from uh, from merge conflicts. So, so there's, this is kind of a little bit hairy. Um, you, you'll also find if you do this, I think, um, because we did and we found this, uh, is that developers start asking, like, if if you're responsible for providing services to your development team, like like the, the CI system and the continuous delivery system, um, then the the developers will start asking for more release management features. They they want to be able to roll back. Uh, they want to do pinning um, so that uh, you can force something to stay on a certain branch instead of updating it. Oh, sorry, on a certain tag instead of updating it man automatically. You might want to roll out uh, updates automatically to staging, but manually gate uh, releases to production. And so you end up with this thing that was once a simple script um, growing and growing and growing. So finally, in the V3 architecture that I want to propose here, uh, we add this idea of a release manager. And this release manager um, is a new box in the diagram. And actually, by adding the release manager, we've refactored things a little bit. Um, now, everything in the system is basically responsible um, for all of the, um, for only one thing, as in each part of the system can just do one thing well. So you can take, uh, let's, let's take a look at how code and Docker images and changes and Kubernetes YAMLs flow through this system now. Uh, so you take version controlled code, um, you push that code to the CI system, same, same thing as before. The CI system pushes a, an image to the registry. Um, and then um, what happens at this point is that this component called the release manager is listening to, for new images to show up in the Docker registry. And when a new image shows up in the Docker registry, it will uh, notice that the new image has shown up. And it will go and consult this uh, scroll that's, that's written, uh, that's marked here as the policy. Um, and then the idea with the policy is that for certain clusters, like your staging cluster, you might want to deploy everything automatically. But for other clusters, like your production cluster, uh, you might want to uh, manually deploy things. So depending, so that's an example of the policy. Um, and so in this case, let's assume that the policy is to automatically release. Uh, so the release manager can then go and check out the version control config like the CI system was doing before. It can modify it to update the tag. It can push that new tag back to the version control config. And then the release manager can also do the job of doing the release to the Kubernetes cluster, basically keeping the Kubernetes cluster in sync with whatever is in this version control config. Um, it's like a convergence loop between the version controlled config and, and the cluster, so like wider than, than Kubernetes. And then, of course, Kubernetes will pull that new image down from the Docker registry. Um, and now we finally got to our holy grail of rollbacks not having to go through the CI system. Because you've got this explicit release manager component, users can go and talk to the release manager via a command line interface or a web interface. And they can say, oh, please roll back. And now the release manager can just check out this uh, sort of the middle version. Uh, it can update it so that it refers to the old version, uh, which refers to this image, which is still here, by the way. Um, it can push that change back. Um, then the Kubernetes cluster can get uh, configured with the new config. Um, and of course, uh, it can pull um, the container image, except for the fact that it doesn't need to pull the container image, because rather than building a brand new container image just for an old version of the code, you can actually just roll back to the previous tag uh, on the Docker image. Um, and, and that's something you can do with a release manager. Um, so these are just words that basically describe uh, what I just said, I think. Um, there's also the idea that you can uh, lock a release as a social cue to probably tell people, other people on your team, um, hey, please, uh, please talk to someone on the team before you, uh, before you unlock this and, and roll it up to the new version. There's probably a reason why it was locked uh, to a previous version. Um, so um, as it happens, um, uh, we built this tool. Uh, we built a tool called Flux um, that is available um, open source. Uh, it's also available as part of Weave Cloud, which is the product that we are working on here um, at Weaveworks. 
And Flux is this uh, deployment manager that sits exactly in this architecture like I just described. So um, you have a software team developing an application, pushing to a CI CD system, sorry, pushing to a CI system, which pushes container images to a registry. And then there's this sort of CD component that helps you get these container images safely, reliably, and reproducibly into your production environment. Um, and that's it. I think um, I'm just about in time, yeah, we've got uh, five minutes uh, for some questions. Um, and of course, when we start up the uh, Weave Online User Group um, again in the fall or the autumn, um, then uh, we will go back to other topics. Um, and so uh, that's it. Um, that's the end of my slides, apart from to encourage you to join the Weave User Group um, and also come and hang out with us on Slack. Uh, and we're hiring. Excellent. If everybody a minute or two in case you have any questions. That was quite dense. <laughs> it covered quite a bit. So Yes, I had to go quite quickly, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, so while we're waiting, in case people might have some questions for the chat window, uh, just a reminder, as we mentioned, this is the end of our spring series, and we'll restart our fall series in September. And we already have quite a few great guest speakers who we are starting to line up. Uh, for the summer, however, we will be doing a variety of um, different activities and might actually still have some guest speakers. We're thinking about um, Ask Me Anythings, or thinking about some office hours, you know, all in these variety of areas where hopefully by now you've seen that our WeaveWorks team is quite knowledgeable, whether it's containers, microservices, Kubernetes, Prometheus monitoring, um, CDCI, and other areas where we talk about best practices, um, broad information, and like today, our opinions uh, in this space. So please, as always, um, you'll get a survey after this. If there are any other areas where you feel that you'd love for us to cover more, um, I should actually mention container security has been a big one. So we ended this season with um, a few speakers and topics on that, and we'll continue that in the summer as well. Um, but also within Meetup, if you signed up through Meetup, um, we have plenty of places where you can always add your comments or add your requests. So we gather all of those and we choose our content according to that. So please share that there. So with that, if there aren't any questions, then thank you again. It's so great to see regular um, attendees here of our user group. So hopefully we'll see you at future events this summer and in the fall. So thank you again for joining. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Ray.